All right, you guys, as you can see by the thumbnail, I'm back with another one like the other one. So check it out. As you guys know, I had to take a couple of days off to handle some important personal business, but staying true to his word, my boy has been calling every day and the stories have been adding up. So I want to hurry up and get these out to you guys. I'm already backed up. It's already late in the day and I haven't done nothing but work on this story. So let me get this out so I can finish the rest of my day and get on with the next story. Anyway, this story right here, you guys got to keep in mind, all these stories, they kind of happened around the same time. I'm sure we'll get off into other stories about other different Mexican mafia members, but a lot of this stuff, it happened right after 2014 when the yards were just being established, when a lot of the Mexican mafia members were hitting the yards, the NF members were just hitting the yards, and a lot of this stuff was just being established. So this is another one that kind of is on the tail end of a story that you guys just heard. And then there's another story that's going to be after this one that's a banger that's going to be on the tail end of that other story that you guys heard about with respects to the Paisa that was a connection for the phones, the cell phones. And then he ended up getting caught up and they took him and a couple of other Paisas off the yard. But without further ado, let me just jump straight into this story right here. So, so this story, everything that's happening right now is on the tail end of... You know, when, when Alfie from Happy Valley and Chavo from Bakersfield are there in Folsom. And basically, they're already established. They've been there for a while. You know, they have their entourages established. And, you know, they're running the yard. But in the meantime, in between time, this individual, Palomino from Fresno, he drives up. And, you know, when I think about this, I wonder how it is as far as, you know, the whole upstaters and the Sureños. If there's that same kind of feeling when you know, a Mexican mafia member from Northern California or one that's, you know, living in Northern California, if there's any kind of, you know, any feelings or or if there's any differences between a Mexican mafia member that's, you know, from LA opposed to one that's from Northern California. I just wonder, you know, if there's any, any kind of differences, probably not because you're dealing with the criminal organization. And when I think about it, if this was an NF member and I was active and this NF member was from somewhere out in LA, it wouldn't matter one bit to me. I wouldn't care where he was from. He's he's a brother. So that's probably all that matters with these guys as well. But, it, you know, when I was hearing the story, it's something that, that crossed my mind. I was just wondering, like, you know, is it a little bit different for them when, you know, a Mexican mafia member from Northern California pulls up? Do they embrace them different? Do they, you know, act different towards that individual because there's quite a few of them that were from like the valley that that I personally know of but anyways so you know when when an individual like Palomino drives up a brother those in the know like Chavo and Alfie I'm sure they knew as soon as he hit the yard it's common for those you know individuals like like Chavo and, and Alfie to know immediately when somebody like that hits the yard or prior to. And, you know, we have our ways of knowing. You got clerks that work in the watch office. You got, you know, there's a lot of COs sometimes that that work transportation and, you know, they might give somebody a heads up. So either way, when Palomino pulled up, Chavo and Alfie both heard about it. So this whole thing about orientation, I don't know if this is something that started just recently or if this is the way that it's kind of always been. You guys got to remember, the last time I hit a main line was like back in 91, 92. Ever since I've been in the shoe program. So, you know, I, I don't know if like when you hit a main line now, if it's just part of the routine, part of the program to go through orientation before you get kicked out to the yard. Anyways, in this case right here, Palomino drives up and he goes through orientation. They, they have him housed in an orientation building. So he's there. He's in his cell, and at some point, he sees a porter out there on the tier, and he makes contact with him. He calls him over to the cell, and he's like, hey, you know, my name's such and such, and he starts, you know, picking this porter's brain. He's like, hey, do I have any primos here? As I mentioned to you guys in one of the previous stories that I told you guys before, there seems to be some type of distinction when you mention a Southsider or a Sureño or a Camarada or a Primo. There's distinctions for those titles. I don't know if this is, you know, a designation under the old leadership structure or if this is still something that they use. But back in these days right here, 2014, 2015, that's the way it was set up. 
So he asked this porter, you know, do I got any primos that are, that are here? So, I mean, basically what he's asking him is if there's anybody there that might be working under him. And that's something that's also common knowledge, not amongst everybody on the yard, but amongst a few that, you know, when they pull up, it's common for like us. I'll give you guys an example, because a lot of these things, there's a lot of parallels. So if I pull up and, you know, I ask if there's anybody there that might be there from the city, if there's anybody there from the Bay Area that might be, you know, functioning within my, my NF street regiment out on the streets, it, it's common knowledge to know amongst the fellas like, hey, this individual was functioning out there under B, or this guy was functioning under, you know, Bubba from Salinas, or this guy was functioning under, you know, this individual from San Jose. So it's the same thing. So he's asking him if there's anybody there that, you know, is was part of his crew. So the porter, you know, the porter starts throwing names out there of individuals that, you know, that might be associated with him. And so he drops a name, Artie Boy from Los, from Los Angeles, from the San Fernando Valley. So as soon as he says that, the old man is like, Artie Boy, is he a youngster? Is he an older dude? And the porter tells him, like, you know, he's a little bit older. He's been here for a minute. So the old man's like, okay, that's got to be him. So, you know, although Artie Boy might be a common name out there in, you know, Southern California, it's not that common. So the old man hears, you know, the name Artie Boy from Los. And, you know, he figures it's got to be the same individual that he was working with out there. He tells the porter, he's like, check this out, bro. He's like, I'm going to strike up this kite. What I need you to do is give it to Artie Boy and tell him it's for me, Palomino. Tell him to go ahead and get at, you know, to, to read it, to get back at me and just let him know that I'm here and that I'll get with them as soon as I come off orientation. So it's not that hard to figure out. The porter, he tells him, OK, he goes, go ahead and strike it up. I'll be back. And he smashes off, he pushes his broom down the tier, does whatever he's doing. Anyways, when Palomino's done striking up the kite, he calls the porter back over and he tells him, I got this ready for Artie Boy, go ahead and, and give it to him and tell him to get back at me ASAP as soon as he can. So the porter, he takes the kite, he goes out to the yard, he strolls the yard, he locates Artie Boy, and he tells him. And Artie Boy is somebody that he knew, was somebody that he personally associated with on the yard. He wasn't just another Sureño out there from another building that he heard of. This was somebody he actually fucked with on the yard. So you know, he goes out there, he runs into Artie Boy, and he's like, hey, he's like, the old man told me to give this to you, Pete. And, you know, he said to get at him as soon as you, as soon as you get a chance, go ahead, check it out, read it, and then get back at him. And Artie Boy's like, the old man, Pete, who are you talking about? He's like, you talking about Palomino? And the porter says, yeah, yeah, Palomino from Fresno, the old man. And Artie Boy goes, oh, shit, he's here? He's here? He pulled up, and, and the porter tells him, yeah, you know, he's here, bro. He's on orientation. He'll probably be on orientation for a couple of days, but, you know, he said to give this to you and to go ahead and get back at him. So whenever you, whenever you're ready, bro, you know, let me know I'm over there with him. I'll make sure that he gets it. And again, you guys got to remember this all happened around the same time. Everybody was getting kicked out of the shoot program. There was like the first wave of, you know, a, a lot of the members came out on the first wave and then there was a second wave. Palomino was one of the ones that came out on the second wave. So by the time he got out there, a lot of the Mexican Mafia members that were already out there on the yards were already established. So he pulls up and, you know, this is this is the beginning of him getting himself established. So after Artie Boy read the kite, he goes back out to the yard and he gets with the porter, the one that gave him the kite. And he tells him, he's like, look, check this out, bro. He's like... Just go ahead and give the old man a verbal, a verbal confirmation that I got that, that I'll look into that, that I'll take care of that as soon as possible. As soon as I find out what he was asking me in his kite, I'll get right back at him. Tell him, you know, for now, I just want to go ahead and just give him a verbal. I don't want to write nothing down that will get me caught up. You know, I'm not going to deal with the whole, you know, taking a chance of, of my kite getting intercepted and you know, being the end of my career. So he was just playing it safe. And that's common. A lot of the times, you know, guys are skeptical about writing anything down because kites have a way of falling into the wrong hands or people, you know, somehow losing them or them getting intercepted somehow. So, you know, Artie Boy was, was security conscious, obviously. He was like, you know what, just give him a verbal, tell him I'll get back at him and I'll get with him as soon as he gets off orientation. 
So that's what the porter did. He basically, he goes back to the building. He goes up to Palomino's door and he tells him, hey, look, I touched base with Artie Boy. I gave him that one time. And, you know, he said to tell you it's a TD and all that good stuff. He got it. He's in receipt of it. And that he'll get with you when you get off orientation, that he's going to look into the things that you asked him in, in your one time. And that as soon as he finds out, he'll go ahead and get with you. So he's on top of he's on top of whatever you asked him. So the old man's like, cool. He's like, cool. You know, he knows he's only going to be there on orientation for a couple of days, a week at the most. So he tells the porter from that point on, he's like, you know what, from this point on, I'm not here no more. Don't tell nobody else what's going on. Nobody else needs to know I'm here. I'll get with Chavo and Alfie when I come out. My brothers, they already know what time it is. But from this point on, you know, don't mention that I'm here to anybody. Nobody needs to know what's going on. So, you know, for whatever reason, Palomino wanted to stay under the radar. He didn't want nobody else in the building to know that he was there, that he was a brother. He just wanted to keep it under wraps. And obviously he had his reasons. So like I told you guys, the old man was back there on orientation for about four or five days. However long it was, Artie Boy apparently had his way of finding out exactly what day the old man was set to hit the yard. Again, th these, this is common, you know, for... Certain individuals that are out there, you know, that are active, that are out there involved in the politics to know these things. Again, it could be somebody working in the watch office, could be a, a clerk or something like that. Whatever, how, however, he found out, he knew what day they were running classification and what day that, you know, Palomino was, was due to get kicked out on the yard. Because the day he was set to get kicked out to the yard, the porter seen Artie Boy posted up in front of the building, the orientation building, with a big bag of Zuzus and Wham Whams. He had an ice cream <laughs> in one hand. He had a soda in the other hand, probably had a flower on his ear. You know, he was ready to, to hook the old man up when he came out. You know, he was, he was ready to embrace him and give him the red carpet treatment. So the old man comes out. He finally comes out at some point. And, you know, the porter's watching him from across the yard. So as soon as the old man came out, the porter's watching from across the yard. And the first thing Palomino does is give Artie Boy a big bear hug. He gives him a big bear hug. Artie Boy hands him the ice cream cone, gives him his soda, and hands him the bag of Zuzus and Wham Whams. Anyways, that was that. Now Palomino's out there on the yard, and you know it's time to help him get himself established. He's, he's got a lot of different things to do out there. Apparently, when they get out there, one of the first things that they do, as you guys have been hearing in some of these other stories, one of the first things that these guys do is start to build their entourage, start to establish the entourage. And I don't know how they do it. I don't know if there's like set protocol or set you know, ways that they have of doing it, but I would imagine it's probably guys that he knows, you know, either from his neighborhood or from, you know, somewhere where he's from on the streets or guys that might be associated with somebody that he knows, like Artie Boy, because he knows Artie Boy, you know, Artie Boy might say, hey, you know, there's a couple couple homies out here that, that are, are real solid individuals that would probably be good, you know, for your entourage to, uh, you know, keep security on you. So I don't know how they do it, but apparently that's one of the first things that they do you know, to get themselves established out there, make sure that they got that security whenever they're moving around on the yard. Because obviously, again, there's NF members out there now, there's BGF members, there, there's, you know, other group segments on the yard that were considered to be mortal enemies in the past. So, you know, they're not forgetting about all that, even though there's an agreement to end hostilities out there, it still is what it is. There's still a threat out there. So, you know, that's one of the first things that, that Artie Boy helped Palomino, you know, establish out there is his entourage. So I want to say it was the next day when Palomino came out. He comes out to the yard, the porter's across the yard, and, you know, he observes Artie Boy posted up in front of the building that Palomino is now housed in. And, you know, he's watching, and when the old man comes out, you know, Artie picks him up, Artie Boy picks him up, because that's now his job. You know, he's there to help him establish his, his entourage and he's there to keep security on him. And he's got three or four other guys that are not officially part of his entourage, but, you know, they're hitters. And, you know, Artie Boy basically has them there for him. Now, 
whatever happened that that morning, you know, the old man comes up, they touch base with each other, they have a quick conversation. So after they have a quick conversation, the old man takes off. I don't know where he went. Maybe he went back to the building to go grab something. Probably went back to go get a shot of coffee or something like that. Maybe a frajo. Who knows? But, you know, he took off by himself to go back to the building. So Artie Boy hung back with the porter. And they're, they're standing there and they're watching the old man. They're watching him walk the track. And, you know, he's making his way to the building. And in the meantime, in between time, there's another Sureño by the name of Beast from Bartlett. And this individual Beast, supposedly his name was befitting. He was a big dude, he was aggressive, and he was a beast. So that's obviously why they called him Beast. But this individual, you know, he's the type of dude that's always out there doing push-ups, always out there working out, doing burpees. He got some size on him. So he's one of those type of guys. He's out there, you know, on the yard all day, every day. But he's always out there on the yard getting his money. He's either on the dip bar or the pull-up bar, or he's got a water bag, or he's in the corner doing push-ups. He's out there, you know, he's out there getting his money, and he's got some size on him. And this dude is, you know, he's known to be an aggressive type of individual. But obviously, he's brainless, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So, you know, Beast is out there. Beast from Bartlett, he's out there on the yard, and I guess one of his part of his routine whenever he would hit the yard is to first come out there and run however many laps he would run a day. He'd come out there, hit the track, and he'd run 10, 15, 20 laps, whatever it was. So he comes out, he's running the track, and the old man is on his way to the building while Beast is running the track. And I guess at some point, you know, they cross paths, and as they're crossing paths, Beast ends up running into the old man. He barrels into him, almost knocks him over. And, you know, Palomino is an older guy. I don't know how old he was, 50s, 60s or whatever, but he was he's an old man, older man. So he almost knocks him over. And Beast, being the brainless individual that he is, you know, he runs into the old man and he tells him, hey, old man, he's like, watch out, watch where you're going. What the hell's wrong with you? Don't you see me trying to run right here? So that's what he says. Instead of, hey, dispense us, excuse me, my bad or whatever. He runs into him and, you know, he tells the old man, hey, shame on you for running into me. You know, can't you see me running here? So as soon as he does that, Artie Boy and the porter look at each other like they, they both know instantly that it's all bad. And, you know, if you can tell by the expression on the old man's face, you know, the expression said it all right there. The old man was livid. He was mad. You know, this fool just embarrassed him. He came out there, ran into him. And I'm sure some of you have had that happen to you. Somebody steps on your shoe or somebody bumps into you and they don't say, excuse me. Now, you can imagine that happening to somebody like, you know, a C, Mexican Mafia member or an NF member that has, you know, most of us had had eagles. So you can imagine how he probably reacted when that happened. So after that happens, you know, Beast barrels into him, almost knocks him over. He keeps going. He says what he said, and he kept running the track. So Artie Boy and the Porter, they make their way over to where the old man is. And, you know, again, Artie Boy knows just by the expression on the old man's face. He's got that look on his face like it's all bad. And so as soon as Artie Boy, you know, catches up to the old man, he tells him, he's like, hey, hey P, he's like, hey, old man, what do you want me to have done to this? this dummy that just ran into you. He's like, I seen the whole thing. He's like, whatever you want me to, you know, whatever you want done, it's all good. So again, you know, by the expression on the old man's face, it was already clear, you know, to go ahead and deal with that individual. You know, he fucked up. He should have said, excuse me, but he didn't. And, you know, one could probably make an argument. Is it Beast's fault for not knowing who was there, for not being conscious of who's around him, especially an older dude that might've just pulled up? Is it his fault for being, you know, careless with that? Or is it, you know, can you maybe put a little bit of the blame on Palomino because he wanted to stay low under the radar? You know, he didn't want nobody in the building or anybody else on the yard to know who he was, what his status was. So as far as all the other Sorenos knew, they, they just looked at him as just another old man. Nobody had any idea, including Beast of who he was, what his status was, or anything like that. So that's probably why Beast thought that, you know, well, no doubt, that's why Beast thought that he could just run into him 
and blatantly just disrespect him like that because he thought he was just another Sureño. But come to find out, this was somebody with some status. However it happened, it didn't matter. At the end of the day, Beast did what he did, and he was already in trouble. So whatever happened from that point on, Beast said what he said, he did what he did, and they already started putting, you know, putting things in motion to get him off the yard. And he was oblivious to this. He had no idea. He didn't know that he had just disrespected somebody with some status. He was just being Beast. That's the kind of individual he probably was. With a name like Beast and the way he was, you know, acting on the yard, being aggressive, that's probably, you know, the way that he was, thinking that he could just, you know, run into somebody or because he had a little bit of size on him that, you know, he could do shit like that and get away with it. But this was the wrong guy to run into, obviously. And it's things like this. It's the small things like this that always escalate and lead to something bigger. In prison, it's something as small as stepping on somebody's shoe, running into somebody, you know, not saying excuse me, doing one of the, you know, doing something as small as that, that, you know, might be interpreted as disrespect by somebody else can end up being the reason why you get stabbed and, you know, the reason why you get your head taken off. But like I said, Beast was oblivious to it. It, it happened and he continued on with, with his day, like nothing had happened. You know, again, on a personal note, sometimes, you know, me, myself, just thinking back on personal experiences, there's reasons why I would pull up to a prison like that and I would want to fly under the radar because there might be something going on. There might be something that I'm looking into. I might not want somebody to know that I'm there on the yard, but you know, there comes, there's, there's downfalls that come with that. And this is one of them. Like I said, whenever, you know, an NF member or Mexican mafia member hit the yard, the yard starts buzzing. People want to know who he is, where he's at, where he's from, what he looks like, all that good stuff. And, you know, the fact that, this one situation right here, the way that it happened where Palomino didn't want it announced on the yard, you know, of who he was or or what his status was, obviously it ended up having a, a detrimental effect on Beast. So when Artie Boy had the conversation with the old man, the old man told him, hey, you better take care of that. He basically told him to take care of it. Go ahead and have that dude whacked. I mean, in so many words, you need to take care of it. That's what he was telling him. So what Artie Boy does is, you know, the porter, he's somebody that, like I said, He's somebody that associated with, with Artie Boy, you know, on a, on a daily basis. But Artie Boy, from the time he talked to the old man, he walks back over to the porter and he tells him, hey, check it out. I got this man. Fall back. I need you to fall back. I'm going to go jam this fool up right now. If he gets crazy, I'm going to whack him. Apparently, Artie Boy had a bone crusher on him, a nasty bone crusher. And, you know, even though he told the porter to fall back, the porter fell back. But he stayed in close proximity to where, you know, Artie Boy jammed up Beast. Because what happened was, is as Beast continued to run the track, Artie Boy walked across the field and, you know, stopped in an area where he was basically going to shortstop Beast when he came around the track. So as Beast runs around the track and he gets closer, Artie Boy walks out and he puts his hand up and he tells him, hey, stop. So... Beast not knowing, I mean, these two, from what, what I gathered, they really didn't have a lot of interaction out on the yard. So when Beast seen Artie Boy walk out in front of him, he kind of stopped it aggressively and was like, what's up, bro? And, and Artie Boy tells him, he's like, hey, check this out, bro. He's like, that old man that you ran into, you know, the same one that you ran into, the one you disrespected and didn't say excuse me to. And so, you know, Beast being the type of individual that he was described as being, being the aggressive type of individual he was, as soon as Artie Boy said that, he was like, and so what? So when he said that, Artie Boy tells him, and so what? Huh? He's like, well, check this out. He's like, you better walk over there to that old man right now, and you better apologize for running into him, because that's a carna. And as soon as he said that, Beast just had that look on his face like he knew he didn't fucked up. He's like, you know you didn't fucked up, right? I mean, you know you didn't fucked up, right? <laughs> so Beast realizes that he fucked up. Well, how come I wasn't told that this, you know, he's probably thinking, how come I wasn't told that that was a C? You know, usually when a C hits the yard, you know, we're told about these, these types of things. You know, how come I wasn't made abreast of that? 
But either way, he knows he's in a in a bad predicament right now. He tells Artie boys like, okay, I'll I'll go over there and tell him, bro. You know, I didn't know he was a C. I didn't know he was a Kana. He goes, I'll go over there and tell him. So Artie boy backs off and he lets Beast continue to run the track. And Artie boy apparently he walks back over to where the porter is at, and they kind of just hang back and watch Beast run over to where the old man's at. So he runs up and. As he's running up towards the old man, what do you think he does? You know, instead of Beast, you know, going over there, running over there, and then stopping when he got towards the old man and, and you know, walking up to him and telling him, hey, sir, you know, Spencer inter introducing himself. My name is Beast from Bartlett. And, you know, I just ran into you a few minutes ago. You know, I was, I was kind of messing around with you. I didn't mean no disrespect or anything like that. You know, Spencer, my bad anything like that. What he does is he continues to run. As the old man's walking, he continues to run. And when he gets close to him, he grabs him by the back of his shirt, by both by both shoulders. And he kind of spins him around. And it, this is Beast's way of playing with this guy. This is why I say this dude must have been a brainless individual. He kind of spins the old man around playing with him, you know, as a way of kind of like just joking with him. And Again, this is an old man. You know, this guy can barely walk a straight line. He ends up almost, you know, eating it. This guy had to spin him and, and catch him. But, you know, he spins him around and he tells him, he's like, hey, you know, Spencer, you know, for running into you or whatever. And he continues to run off. It was like he just did it in real fast as he was running by. Grabbed him, spun him around, and then kept on running. What do you think happened from that point on? I can imagine, I mean, I'm as as I'm telling the story, I can picture the visuals. The old man is probably like, he's probably in a state of disbelief for one, but now he's really pissed off. Now he's probably even pissed off at Artie Boy. Like, bro, I don't know what you told this idiot, but did you see what this dude just did? He ran up and damn near threw me on, on my face. So Artie Boy and the porter, as soon as, Beast did that. They look at each other like, you fucking got to be kidding me. Are you serious? Like, they, they can't believe what they just seen. So right away, Artie Boy starts walking over to Palomino. He tells old man, he's like, hey, hey old man, he's like, uh, you don't got to say nothing else. I'm already taking steps to get this dude off the yard. We're going to we're going to whack his ass right now. So. The old man was like, yeah, man, you better take care of it. You know, this dude must be crazy. This dude, you know, what do you guys got? J-Cats running around out here? Is that dude on medication? What makes that dude think it's okay to run up and grab me by my shirt and almost face plant me on the ground? He's like, that dude's fucking crazy. I don't want him on the yard another day. So meanwhile, Chavo and Alfie, they hit the yard. So while all this was happening, they were actually on their way to go talk to Palomino with their entourages. And all this happened within a matter of minutes. So this all happened the same day. All these events just kind of kicked in one after the other. And you guys got to understand, this is Palomino's. This is just his second day on the yard. So what Artie Boy does is he goes and gets at one of his hitters out there on the yard, an individual named Tricky from Columbus Street, from the San Fernando Valley. He gets it tricky and another guy. He couldn't remember the other guy's name, but he gets at these two individuals and they got two of the biggest bone crushers out there on the yard. So he tells Tricky, he's like, check this out. This individual that's running the track right there, he points out Beast and he's like, you know, Beast is known. He's somebody that, that Tricky knew on the yard. He's seen him out there before. So he tells Tricky, he's like, check this out. This is what we're going to do. He's like, you see that individual right there? He pointed Beast out. And, you know, Tricky had, he'd been on the yard for a while. He knew who Beast was. He'd seen him out there. Beast, like I said, was a big dude. He stood out. But he told Tricky, he's like, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to let him run a couple more laps and we're going to let him get nice and tired. And then we're going to whack his punk ass. He just disrespected one of the C's. So Tricky and this other Swarano, they're ready to go. They got two of the biggest bone crushers on the yard. And they post up by a building that's kind of close to where the track is because that's where they're going to get him in that area right there. They, they, you know, they had it all mapped out. As soon as he gets by wherever it was, the two building or the one building at the far end of the, of the, of the field, we're going to hit him right there, you know, two squads. So what they did was 
Beast being a big dude, being a good sized dude that he was, you know, they anticipated him fighting back. They thought that, you know, he wasn't the type of dude that wasn't going to go down easy. They felt like they needed to put four guys on him. Tricky and this other guy, and then they had another two-man crew that were supposed to, you know, kick in as soon as Tricky and the other guy got on him. So, you know, they're out there. Beast is running the track. He's oblivious to everything that's going on. And, you know, he runs a couple more, couple more laps, and, you know, it's go time. Hardy Boy gives the go ahead to Tricky and his and his boy. And as soon as Beast comes around the corner, they get on him. Boom, bah, 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 bah. They start hitting him, right? <laughs> they start hitting him with, with these bone crushers and, and they're they're going in on him good. And you know, as anticipated, Beast starts fighting back. He, you know, he squares up with them. And I don't know if he didn't see the pedazos that they had, but he starts fighting back. You don't try to take off, you don't run. He stood up and he's fighting back. Well, as they're going at this dude, so this guy that, so the guy that's with Tricky, you know, initially they both started whacking this dude, but at some point he dives at Beast's feet and, you know, he locks on, he latches on to his feet, probably trying to take him down. And eventually he does take him down. So now they're on him on the ground. This guy's got his feet, Tricky starts hitting him, and then the other two come up and start whacking him. So you got three hitters that are whacking Beast now. Well, in the course of stabbing Beast, one of them ended up stabbing Tricky in the back of the neck. It was an accident, but, you know, I can imagine that happening. You know, being in those situations or being in a similar situation like that myself, when you got bodies flying around and you're stabbing, you know, people are stabbing people and, and you know, it's, it's it gets chaotic like that. A lot of the times people will get you'll catch friendly fire. That's what happens. You know, you're, you're just stabbing anything, anything that moves. And apparently, you know, one of them ended up trying to stab Beast and by accident ended up catching Tricky in the back of the neck. You know, at first, nobody thought it was really bad. They just thought that, you know, Tricky probably got grazed or something like that. But, you know, after they, after they get on Beast, you know, they hit him. They hit him pretty good. They almost kill him. At some point, you know, they lay the yard down. These guys all prone out. They come in, they cuff them all up, and they take everybody that, you know, the guys that they thought were the hitters, they take them first. They end up life flighting Beast out because he was in bad shape. He ended up get, having a lung puncture, and, you know, he had some other holes in him, but he ended up getting life flighted out. That's when they also realized that the one that Tricky caught to the back of the neck was a lot more severe than they initially thought because they also ended up life flighting Tricky out as well. So, you know, they're in the hospital and come to find out later when Tricky ends up coming back out or, you know, however they found out whether, you know, Tricky was in the hospital and somebody tapped in with his family, with his girl, because everybody's kind of tied in with each other and they have their way of making contact with family or with, you know, their homies in situations like this, when they end up in the hole, they have ways of contacting, you know, somebody else that they know. And that's how, you know, information is, is facilitated. So that's when they found out that Tricky was paralyzed from the neck down on the whole left side of his body. Apparently, you know, he must have come back out to the yard or, you know, they seen him later at some point later. And apparently he was walking with one of those, you know, it's like a, it's not a crutch, but it's like a cane that has a brace that goes around your forearm. And, you know, the way that it was described, no disrespect to, to Tricky, but the way it was described, him as walking, it was like he walked like a penguin, almost like somebody with polio or something like that. That's how bad it was. The whole left side of his body was paralyzed. So, I mean, here you have a situation where, you know, the first thing I think about is, you know, a situation like, when Palomino drove up and he didn't want everybody else to know, you know, who he was on the yard and, and maybe it was for reasons of security. I'm, I'm sure he obviously had his own reasons, but you know, in a situation like that, this is what happens. But at the same time, it just goes to show that, you know, prison is a different environment. You know, you can't bump into somebody or step on somebody's shoe or say something disrespectful and not say, excuse me or look at somebody 
in an aggressive way and think that there's not going to be some kind of repercussion. You know, prison, if they play by a different set of rules in there, that might not mean nothing on the streets. Somebody, you know, you might bump into somebody on the streets, you might step on somebody's shoe, or you might look at them crazy and they'll just look at you like you are crazy and just keep on walking. But in prison, respect is everything. And when you do something like that, the, the intended victim or the non-intended victim feels like they have to step up and do something. You know, their reputation is on the line. Their respect is on the line. It goes to the extremes, like this situation right here. Somebody ended up getting stabbed. This right here ended up with two people getting stabbed. One ended up getting paralyzed, and that was by friendly fire or, like I said, collateral damage. So, you know, that's the first thing I think about. You know, the second thing I think about is the mentality that Beast had. That's that bully mentality, you know, going around, running into people, acting like you can disrespect people and like nothing's going to happen to you because you got a little bit of size on you and maybe you look like an intimidating dude. People don't care about that shit. You know what I'm saying? Especially in prison. Again, respect is everything in prison and people will die. They will die trying to get their respect if that's what it takes. Because if you allow somebody to disrespect you, you allow somebody to bump into you, you allow somebody to step on your shoe or you allow somebody to, to feel like they can come at you like that and there's no repercussions, then they're going to keep doing it and they're going to keep pushing until, you know, they can't push no more. So again, this story right here, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can look at it, but but whenever you're dealing with Mexican mafia members, Nuestra Familia members, these guys have egos. They have egos and they expect to be treated a certain way. And when they're not, or when somebody crosses that line, there's serious repercussions all the time. You know, you can look at that and say, you know what, maybe he should have just been like, hey, youngster, hey, come here, check this out. And maybe he could have resolved it right there. Maybe he could have told him like, hey, this is who I am. And don't ever let that happen again. Otherwise, you know, that could have been the end of your career right there. And it was. It ended up being the end of Beast's career. He ended up locking it up after this incident. He went When he came back from the hospital, they put him in ad say. And from that point on, he knew he was done. So we locked it up. But, you know, one can, one can argue that Palomino might have been able to pull this individual aside. And it could have been resolved with just like giving him a, a, a good tongue lashing, chewing on his ear, telling him, hey, youngster, you know, you can't be doing that. You know, you, you're lightweight crazy that, you know, you did something like that and show him, you know, the, the the gravity of his mistakes. But he didn't do that. That wasn't, maybe he felt like it wasn't his job to do that, that this guy should have known better. This was a level four yard. So maybe he was looking at it like that. Either way, that's what ended up happening. I hope you guys enjoyed this story. You know, there's different ways of looking at it. There's things that you can take from it. There are some valuable lessons that one can learn from it. You know, basically for the youngsters though, this is another reason why you need to stay your ass out of prison. Things like that, those trivial things can get you killed in prison. So prison is not a place where you want to be. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this story. The one I got for you guys tomorrow, it's a banger. Trust me, it's a, a cap off to one of the stories I told you guys about where the paisa ended up getting stabbed and taken off the yard. He ended up getting caught up, the paisa that had all the cell phones. There's a cold twist that involves Sergio from Pacas and Spider from Catarana. So I'm going to get into that one tonight. Hopefully I'll be done with it tomorrow so I can get it out to you guys tomorrow. But, you know, we're going to keep these stories coming. I got a lot more for you guys. So you guys keep tapping in, keep dropping your comments. Give me your thoughts on some of these things, what you think. Those of you that were there, tap in and drop your comments. Anyways, I'm going to go ahead and close on that note there. We'll be back tomorrow with another banger. I'm going to try to get you guys out and inner demons as well. You guys got to understand, I'm just now getting back to it because I had to take care of some things on, the, on a personal note. So just bear with me. But once again, man, we'll be back tomorrow. I hope you guys enjoyed it. This is your boy B and I'm out.